temperature, pressure, humidity, the atmosphere, the climate. We have cycles like El Nino. Regions of droughts and regions of enhanced precipitation. Global warming, weather patterns. Snowstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes. Weather affects everyone. Cold, sunny, hot, dry. Our planet has a variety of weather and climate patterns. And though they have a lot in common, weather and climate are not exactly the same thing. Well, weather is what we see going on all around us. And so weather has to do with the day-to-day -day occurrence of weather conditions, temperature, humidity, wind, precipitation. Uh, when we average that over some extended period of time, say a season or a year or a decade or a century, we call the average weather that we get uh, climate. Um, an old joke that we sometimes tell is that uh, climate is what you expect based on statistics. Weather is what you actually get. Weather is what happens minute to minute. Weather includes daily changes in precipitation, temperature, and wind conditions in a given location. Climate describes the total of all weather occurring over a period of years in any given place. The textbook definition for what climate is, is that climate is the average of the weather. You find the average, you find the standard deviation, and you say that's the climate. Climate tells us average weather conditions, like weather sequences, such as seasons, and weather events, such as tornadoes or floods. Climate tells us what usually takes place, or is expected. Well, climate's important because we want to know what weather to expect. Uh, there are many things that affect our lives that depend on the average of weather and not just the instantaneous um, temperature or precipitation. Sometimes you need to know the climate because you need to know, for example, if you can plant this type of crop or this type of crop. Sometimes you need to know what you can do in two hours. That's your weather. While weather can change by the minute, climate too can change over a longer term. Climatology is the study of the long-term weather patterns and the fluctuation in climate. The fluctuations of climate are quite drastic. Um, and it's only in the last 100 million years or so that it's actually been quite stable. And that's probably why humans have really flourished and life in general has really flourished. The Earth, at least over the past two million years, seems to move from one long period of time that might last for a few tens of thousands of years uh, where the earth is very cold and sometimes we call that ice box earth to a period of time when earth is generally far warmer and sometimes that's called hothouse earth or greenhouse or greenhouse earth. Granted, we we're not really sure what the exact temperatures were a million years ago. We do, we have ways of looking at ice cores um, to sort of figure out what the climate was generally. Ice cores are one of the best records of past climates in that they trap data into annual bands where it is easy for scientists to see exactly when certain things happened. We can pick apart every annual band and by measuring the chemistry, the isotopic chemistry of the annual bands, we can see variations in climate on a year or even sub-year scale going back, in this case, several thousand years. Rocks and many other materials on Earth can also hold climate information and can be helpful to giving clues to the past. So we're always looking for materials, whether it's lake sediments, ocean sediments, um, tree rings, uh, or glacial ice that goes back 100,000 years. We can look at these on an annual basis or a decadal basis and see changes in climate in the past. And by understanding the past, what's going to happen in the future. Forecasting the weather has always been vital for many reasons. It affects our lives, as well as the economy, transportation, and other industries. But for centuries, before people had adequate instruments, predicting the weather was based solely on observations and interpretations of the appearance of the sky. It wasn't until the 17th and 18th centuries when inventions such as the barometer in 1643 by Italian physicist Evangelista Torricelli could measure the pressure of the air. 
Then, the humidity was able to be measured when the hygrometer was invented in 1644. In 1714, German physicist Daniel Fahrenheit developed the mercury thermometer, and it was these instruments of measurement that led to the birth of meteorology. Meteorology is the scientific study that focuses on weather processes and forecasting. Well, meteorology is a very new science. Um, quantum mechanics were discovered and described before anybody knew what a cold front looked like. Uh, the big difference between looking at the weather now and looking at the weather as a farmer might have done a century or two ago, these days we can look at a weather map and see the warm front coming, whereas people couldn't see that a century or two ago. And more and more sophisticated meteorological equipment has been developed over the years. One of the most important element in advancing our understanding of meteorological uh, variables, that is, of temperature, of state of the oceans, of state of the atmosphere, of state of the glaciers, has been the technological advances in satellite. NASA and other satellites that are around the globe are giving us a stream of information by the second. With this stream of information, meteorologists develop better and better models to make more accurate weather forecasts. It's the, one of the purest examples I know of the scientific method at work. We, we, we first describe something, then we create theories based on fundamental principles of math and physics and chemistry, and then we use those principles to make forecasts that we can test. The way we learn the most is by making bad forecasts and figuring out what went wrong so that we can revise our models and make better predictions the next time. Because meteorologists aren't the only people who care about them. The public cares and there's great pressure to make the forecast better, which forces us to go back and test our ideas um, and, and try to fix the things that didn't work out right. A planet's climate is largely determined by its size its distance from the sun, and the makeup of its atmosphere. Well, from a climatologist's perspective, it's interesting to examine the climates of other planets um, because it's, uh, it helps us compare what we see on Earth to a very different environment. It helps us test theories for how Earth's climate might have evolved and, 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 and what maintains temperature and, and the properties of the climate as we know it. The climate of Mars, for example, has very little oxygen compared to the climate of Earth, and that is almost certainly because much of the oxygen on Earth uh, has been produced by life. Earth is very large compared to Mars, so we, can, we have a, an atmosphere, whereas Mars is so small, the gravitational attraction of the, the planet doesn't hold a big atmosphere. So we have a big atmosphere, we have water, that's I mean the big one. And it's thought that the atmosphere came about as a result of the degassing of magmas in, in the early Earth as it was forming, sort of jettisoned all of these different types of gases, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in different amounts of course back then. And then, you know, the evolution of our Earth has included the evolution of the atmosphere. What stayed in, what went out, um, sort of ended up depending on what was on the planet of the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere is an envelope of gases that surrounds the surface of the planet and has evolved over the past four billion years to the composition we know today. Though the composition is not constant, the major components are nitrogen and oxygen. Together, these two gases make up approximately 99% of the dry atmosphere. If the oxygen and nitrogen were all that mattered, the atmosphere would be a pretty simple, boring place. But in fact, a lot of what we think of as weather has to do with water in its gaseous form that can change phase to so solid or liquid in clouds. And a lot of the um, uh, temperature effects of this gas um, have to do with, with gases that are present only in very small quantities, carbon dioxide and methane and ozone, um, so-called trace gases. These most important trace gases are also known as greenhouse gases. These gases let the rays of the sun pass through to the planet, but they hold in the heat that comes up from the sun-warmed earth in much the same way as the glass walls of a greenhouse do. Without these gases, heat would escape back into space 
and Earth's average temperature would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder. The atmosphere is also important in that it contains the air we breathe. It protects us from dangerous solar rays and radiation, and it recycles water and other chemicals. Without the atmosphere, life as we know it could not exist on Earth. The atmosphere has four layers based on chemical composition, temperature, movement, and density, beginning with the troposphere, where we live, which extends about seven miles up and is the most dense part of the atmosphere. Just above is the stratosphere, which extends upwards about 30 miles. The important ozone layer, which absorbs and scatters ultraviolet radiation, is in this layer. Next, the mesosphere is just above the stratosphere and extends about 50 miles. Here, temperatures can be as low as minus 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there is the thermosphere, which starts just above the mesosphere and has no well-defined outer boundary, but extends as much as 350 miles. The temperatures can go as high as 3,000 degrees due to the sun's energy. This layer is known as the upper atmosphere. The heat from the sun enters the atmosphere to warm the earth. The energy coming from the sun doesn't arrive to the earth in the same way everywhere. So we have areas that will be hotter than other areas. We know that, for example, the tropical areas around the equator are usually, most of the time, warmer than if you go either north or south. Well, there are various classification schemes that people have um, created um, that, that assign uh, certain sorts of climatic conditions. So uh, precipitation between 10 and 20 inches a year and an annual temperature within a certain range and we'll give the, that sort of climate a name. Then you can make a map that shows the distribution of climate regions or zones across uh, the globe and then you can try to classify those and explain why it's why deserts tend to occur at subtropical latitudes and why uh, why the roaring 40s in the southern hemisphere tend to be wet and cold. The Köppen system, developed by German climatologist Vladimir Köppen, is the most widely used for classifying the world's climates. Its categories are based on averages of temperature and precipitation and recognizes five types. Each is designated by a capital letter. A. Tropical moist climates. B. Dry climates. C. Moist mid-latitude climates with mild winters. D. Moist mid-latitude climates with cold winters. And E. Polar climates with extremely cold winters and summers. Because you have different heating patterns on the Earth, and because the Earth is a rotating system, that generates different uh, areas of pressure. It is the horizontal differences in pressure that brings about the winds. As the air moves, the spinning earth causes the winds to be deflected into spirals. This is called the Coriolis force. In the northern hemisphere, it is deflected to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, air moving from high to low pressure is deflected to the left. However, the Coriolis force is not really a force at all. There is no real force pushing the air around, but it's convenient to call it a force because we put it into an equation right next to other terms that really are forces, like pressure gradients that is, are associated with a, you know, pressure pushing air from one place to another. So the Coriolis force is, a, is an imaginary push that we have to add in to account for the fact that we watch winds blowing around on top of a rotating planet. Large bodies of air are called air masses, and the place where air masses collide is called a front. A cold front has cooler and drier air. A warm front brings clouds and rain as cold air pushes beneath it and lifts the warm air. And this whole amount of sloshing air coming in will give you your bad weather. Precipitation um, depends on having humid air being lifted up. That's how we make clouds and precipitation. 
One of the ways to make air uh, lift, get lifted up, is with a mountain. Mountains and fronts help lift air up, and if the air is lifted high enough, the moisture in the air will eventually cool and condense, and clouds will form. Clouds come in many shapes and sizes, and while they can be spectacular to look at, they can also give us clues about what is going on in the atmosphere. Clouds are classified on the basis of form and altitude. There are low-level clouds that form below 6,500 feet, mid-level clouds which form between 6,500 and 20,000 feet, and high-level clouds that appear above 20,000 feet. The three basic cloud forms are cirrus, which means curl in Latin. Cirrus clouds look like curly wisps of white hair. They are high and thin, and they are sometimes an early signal that thickening clouds could bring light precipitation within a few days. Cumulus, which means heap in Latin, are puffy clouds that resemble clumps of cotton balls, but they have flat bottoms and are usually a signal of fair weather. However, they sometimes develop into very high columns and form what are known as cumulonimbus clouds. Nimbus is Latin for rain. These clouds are commonly associated with thunderstorms and can produce extreme weather such as hail, heavy rain, lightning, and even tornadoes. The third common cloud form is stratus, for layer. Stratus clouds are flat, low-lying sheets that often appear to cover the entire sky. When stratus clouds are very thick and dark, they become nimbostratus clouds, which can produce rain and other precipitation. Hurricanes, thunderstorms, tornadoes, blizzards are all associated with what we call storms and sometimes extreme weather events. Major storms come in different flavors uh, depending on the season we're talking about. We have winter storms where we have very cold air masses and very warm moist air masses that just butt up against each other and if we're far enough north and the weather's cold enough we can have big snowstorms and so forth. The springtime is a very interesting transition season across the Plains states because we still have cold air to the north and quite warm and increasingly warm air to the south. So the temperature gradients can get especially severe. So this is now the season where we can spawn tornadoes. Tornadoes are ideally spun up over flat terrain and all those conditions exist uh, perfectly over the Great Plains of the United States, uh, which is the, the world's principal region for really severe tornadoes. The heat of summer and early fall can produce some of the most dramatic weather. Thunderstorms form when moist, unstable air is lifted vertically into the atmosphere. Hurricanes are some of the largest, most powerful storms on Earth also known as typhoons and cyclones in some parts of the world. These complex storms usually develop over warm ocean waters, which turns pressure and moisture into huge spiral engines. These storms can have devastating wind speeds up to 150 miles an hour and can wreak havoc on everything in their path. While weather can affect our lives, we too have an effect on our Earth's atmosphere and therefore the climate and weather. One of these issues is a hole in the ozone layer in the Earth's troposphere. A serious problem which was recognized by scientists working down in Antarctic uh, research stations that realized that there was literally a hole in the ozone layer that developed seasonally over the southern latitudes. This was definitely cause for concern because without the ozone layer, harmful ultraviolet radiation reached the Earth's surface, causing skin cancer, causing glaucoma, to the point where cows grazing in the southern regions of South America were literally going blind from glaucoma. And the scientists went to work on this and they figured out the solution, what actually was causing the ozone hole. The ozone hole is caused by ozone-depleting chemicals in the atmosphere, such as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which were produced by industry for such things as coolants for air conditioning and refrigeration, cleaning solvents for electrical components, propellants for aerosol spray, and even some plastic foam. 
And while science and industries work together to replace CFCs with other chemicals that are less harmful, the ozone layer is still under threat. But the big issue we currently face is climate change and global warming. We're seeing changes in the climate in a short period of time, you know, and it's a result of the carcinogens we're putting into the atmosphere, it's a result of the way we're using our resources. We're quite certain that the planet as a whole is, is warming up. The climate system is getting warmer. We have good temperature data. We can see glaciers receding worldwide. We're somewhat less certain why that's happening. The consensus judgment of the scientific community is that the increase of greenhouse gases, uh, which act as sort of an insulating blanket for long wave radiation, makes it harder for the Earth to radiate heat away from the surface. And we know that CO2 and methane are increasing, and we know that people are the cause of the CO2 and the methane increases. Since the Industrial Revolution, people have burned more and more carbon-based fuels. And at the same time, we have also cut down large swaths of forests, burning the wood and replacing forest with fields. The effect is a dramatic 30% rise in atmospheric CO2 and the beginnings of noticeable impacts on the Earth's climate. And the real fly in the ointment is we don't know exactly what the consequences of the 70 trillion pounds of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere every year will be. Because climate is a very complicated thing. It's hard enough for a w the weatherman to tell us what the weather is going to be tomorrow or next week, but to say we have something that's never happened before sudden influx of huge amounts of CO2 into our atmosphere and it's going to change the patterns of our climate in this way, in this way, in this way. Some of the effects that scientists expect with global warming are erratic weather patterns with more intense storms, droughts and floods, melting of ice caps leading to rising sea levels, and serious disruption of certain agriculture due to changes in rainfall and temperature patterns. I think the thing to do would be to try to figure out how, what we can do to sort of correct it or to, you know, to decrease the impact that we're having on the environment because the sooner we start, the better it's going to be. There are steps we can take to really reduce the production of greenhouse gases, like using cleaner alternative energies such as wind, solar, and water power, as well as making serious efforts to reduce, reuse, and recycle. From weather balloons to satellites, predicting weather has come a long way. But there's still a lot we have to learn about our atmosphere and the various weather we experience. One of the things I really like about meteorology is that many fundamental things have never really been described or explained, so we're still figuring out the basics when it comes to weather and climate. Today, meteorologists and climatologists strive to better understand how weather phenomena like hurricanes and tornadoes form and work. They do this in order to predict these devastating storms and hopefully save lives each year. They also want to learn more about how our atmosphere works and how better to predict future climates. We know that the climate never will be perfectly predictable, but figuring out how predictable it might be and testing our theories on the actual changes that we see in climate is going to be a fascinating topic for research over the next few decades. Over the next few decades, research could show us more and more about how weather affects us and how we affect the weather, teaching us more and more about protecting our planet Earth.